welcome to Life Point. Why don't you stand and join us as we worship? chose to join us this morning for church. My name is Scott Burrow, one of the volunteers with our student ministries. Just excited to be here with all of you. Hey, Pastor Chris started a series last week and we started talking about the church and just that what it means to be part of the church, to, to just believe in the church and to be excited about that. And whether you're joining us online, which we are thrilled to have you as part of our church family, you're here in person, you're doing exactly what he said. He said, come and see what God is doing in the church last week. And that's what we're doing today. In a moment, we're going to join together one of the gifts of the of the church, which is corporate worship together. Before we do that, turn around, greet someone, tell them you're glad they're part of your church family, and you're glad you're here to worship with them.
Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me doubt He's faithful through generations So why would He fail now? He won't
to do. You all can have a seat. In just a moment, Pastor Chris is going to make his way to the stage and we're going to kick off a brand new teaching series. Before we do that, though, I want to make you aware of some things that are happening here at LifePoint. First off, for those of you who are newer to the church, maybe this is your very first time here or you've been coming just for a short while, we're glad you're here. We would love for you at some point during our time together to fill out a connection card. And there's a couple of different ways that you can go about doing that. Uh, you can pull out a card from the seat back pocket in front of you, or you can do it digitally by texting the word CONNECTING, I-N-G on the end of that, CONNECTING to the phone number 94000. Either way, uh, either way you choose to fill that out, be sure to stop out at the Connection Hub after the service in the main lobby. We have a gift for you there. This is a way to say thank you for spending some of your morning with us. Also, for those of you who are new, we want to invite you to something we call Next Steps. It's a one-hour uh, gathering with a breakfast with me on a Sunday morning to find out who we are as a church, why we do what we do. We want to help you answer the question, is Life Point the church home for me? And so that's happening on Sunday, March 26th. You can get signed up for that by going to lifepoint.org slash next steps, or you can head out to the lobby again at the Connection Hub, and they'd be happy to get you signed up for that as well. You know, our LP Kids team is already looking ahead to the summer. They're working on planning for vacation Bible school, and, and their hope, their desire is to be able to open it up to even more kids than last year. But in order for that to happen, they're looking for our help uh, to come alongside their team and volunteer to pull that off. And so there's going to be an informational meeting about VBS and volunteering with that uh, with that event uh, coming up on Sunday, March 19th during the 11 a.m. service. That meeting is going to be held in base camp. And so if that's something that is of interest to you, be sure you mark your calendar for a couple of weeks from now. And then starting this Wednesday is a Recharge, a midweek gathering for the women of our church, not only to connect with one another, but to grow in your faith through you know, being equipped, uh, worshiping together, praying it together, opening God's word together. So that starts this Wednesday. And to get all the information on that, you can go to lifepoint.org slash recharge. By going to that webpage, you can also sign up for the recharge group and receive direct communication from the recharge team. So women, I would encourage you to take that step as well and then come out on Wednesday night. And then finally, for those of you who consider yourself to be part of the LifePoint family, we want to give you an opportunity to continue in your worship through giving. And really the offering is just a way for us to respond in faith through our generosity to all that God is doing in our lives. All right, Pastor Chris has a couple more announcements for us this morning, and then we'll dive in. Thanks, Derek. Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. It's great to have you with us. Also, those who are online, thrilled to have you as well. I want to invite you to experience the Bible in a way that you never have. I want to invite you to experience your faith in a way that you never have, in a way that literally will change the way you view the Bible, the way you read Scripture, the way you understand your faith. And next year in March, I'm going to be leading a trip to Israel for anybody who would be interested in joining me. And so if you hear that, you say, and I can just tell you, it'll change your faith. 
uh, dramatically. And so on March 19th, after uh, the third service up in the foundry upstairs, we're going to have an informational meeting about that trip. So I know a bunch of you have been with me before. Um, you know how it's impacted your life. And so we want to invite others and those who have been before uh, to consider joining me. And uh, it's literally a trip of a lifetime. Um, and I'd have you, love to have you join me. A um, couple, couple other items. Uh, we hope you're always taking advantage of um, when we talk about what's happening here in the announcements and, you know, when you text the word connecting to 94000, that whole thing. And in the bulletin, you see what's going on. You see even like the offerings and uh, the, the church budgets in there as well. You see attendance numbers. And, and those of you who were with us last week, which I imagine a lot of you were, uh, maybe most of you were, uh, it was an incredible week of celebration. Um, I'm just looking at the, when I looked at those attendance numbers, there was 895 people who were here together that day, which was awesome and incredible. Um, um, and then it got me curious, like, because I, I even said last week felt like it did pre-COVID around here. And so I went back and looked, and in 2019, we had that many people and even more about a dozen times that year. And so just from a, like, a people who come to life point perspective, I was like, man, that felt like, that was like the pre-COVID days. And so those who are newer here, last week was like pre-COVID days. And those who were here before, are like, that felt like pre-COVID days. And I look in this room right now, it feels a lot like pre-COVID days. And so I, can't, I love that I get to make this announcement right now. I haven't said this in three years. If you want more room in a service... Uh, first service has plenty of room for you, and second service has a little bit of room for you as well. So just something to consider for this second service. Um, but uh, if, if you like it like this and pack, which I love also, um, obviously you're welcome here, and, and thanks for those who helped us uh, set up a whole bunch of chairs uh, last minute there. Okay, also... Um, this, the last couple of weeks, so awesome, we had uh, um, four students who were baptized. There was Chris, Drake, Emma, and Zo Zoe. So can we praise God? God is doing some great things here at Life Points in the students' lives. And speaking of students, today, our first Sunday, we want to welcome and invite our brand new student pastor up to the stage. Nick, will you come up with your wife, Lauren, and let's give them a Life Point welcome. What's up, dude? Lauren? So good to have you guys here as we uh, kick off this new season and chapter for your life, for our life. Um, we're going to spend the next 30 minutes doing an interview. No, we're not going to do that. We went through that the last few months. Thank you. I know, I, yeah, I know you've been hanging out at LifePoint uh, uh, as we went through that journey, been attending on Sundays, but today's like, you know, first work day, so to speak. Um, but give us just a little bit, just a couple questions for you um, about you and Lauren. Um, maybe let's go back to when you first, like, Lauren, give us like your first date. Like, what was the first thing? Yeah, tell us the first date. I get to brag about this man because he, I was still living in Southern California at the time, and so he drove seven hours to go and see me and took me to a Hillsong United concert okay. for our first date. Has anybody here ever driven seven hours for a first date? Is there anybody else? Okay, we have a couple, so you guys uh, can relate. The rest of us, man, yeah, I, uh, hats off to you. That's incredible. I That's knew what awesome. I wanted. Okay, you knew what you wanted, dude. <laughs> Praise God. I like that. That's good. Okay, and so then you get married. Uh, you went to William Jessup University, one of our partner uh, partners here at LifePoint uh, up in Rockland. Uh, where are you from? Tell us, like, you got married, in, I think, near where you grew up. Yeah, so I, I originated, um, originated, I grew up in the Bay Area. Uh, Pleasanton, Livermore is my hometown. So we actually got married in Livermore uh, at a golf course called Poppy Ridge. Okay. Um, that was in 2021, August 2021, so... Okay, so uh, just been married a short time. Yeah, you're in some change. You're in some change. And so uh, newly married, like what's kind of something that you guys enjoy doing together or having together? What's, what's your deal? Yeah, all kinds of stuff. We play sports, anything outside, get out on the boat, um, wakeboard, surf, uh, all that stuff, paddle boards. Um, but our favorite thing since getting married was adopting our puppy, um, little Gibson. 
Yeah, a little yellow lab. He's okay. adorable. Um, he's one years old now. Uh, he's named after the guitar. Uh, okay. Yeah, right. so right. it's, he, he's a good boy. <laughs> That's interesting. So you play music then? Yeah. Okay, so, so you're also a student pastor and can do music. Um, I thought of calling you this week when Trevor said, I have no voice, but I didn't want to put that on you for your first Thank week. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so uh, so good to have you guys. Just as you're uh, starting off here and thinking about a new chapter, a new season for you guys, um, you think about LifePoint, what are you kind of looking forward to like as you dive in here? Yeah, really just excited to, one, be here finally. Um, yeah. It's been a, a long journey for us in the search and interview, um, discerning God's will, but more excited being a student ministries pastor, um, just excited to get to know all the students, um, get to see and be a part of uh, their walk and their faith journey uh, and helping them navigate their relationship with the Lord. Um, so just super excited about that. I've got more passion than I know what to do with for student ministries. So just super pumped to be here, excited to get up there um, in a couple Couple minutes and go hang out with some kids. That is so great. And uh, as we dive into this new season, we're thrilled to have you on the team, to have both of you guys here. And uh, I know your passion for students, some of that, and I know it'll come up as down the road as you're as sharing with us, preaching and whatnot. Um, you came to faith in, in high school, so I know that's a big part of your journey and the impact of that. So we'll learn more about that in the future. So God bless you guys. Welcome aboard to the Life Point yes, team. Thank Good you. to have you guys. So when our second son, Cameron, was born, we found out quickly that he had some physical challenges. And, and if you have had kids, you know that they feed often when they first come out of the womb, right? Let's figure that out. About how often do you feed a newborn, roughly? Every couple hours, right? So you do the math, and it just seems like it doesn't stop and it doesn't end. Well, most kids, you feed them, and then they do what they do for two hours, and you do it again, and you just kind of do that. Cameron had a little challenge. He would eat, and then after he would eat, 30 seconds, a minute, minute and a half, sometimes two minutes later, he would basically throw up everything he ate. And that was his life, and that was our life. And it went on for a week, and two weeks, and three weeks, and a month, and two months, and we'd go to the doctor, and they didn't have anything to tell us. And in that journey, we figured, okay, well, this is interesting. It wasn't something we planned. And so it is interesting how your whole life kind of changes when you are dealing with someone who throws up every day. Um, when someone gets sick, you know how to manage that for a short period of time. So we had to manage that constantly. And so uh, we discovered, you know, Coverings for the couches and coverings, you know, for, you know, how many rags you needed to have with you at all times and, and how you, you know, how many wash times you had to wash more often and all this. So we went through this journey with Cameron and it was just kind of our life. And we get a year into this, a year. And finally, uh, our doctor uh, talked to us and spoke with us and said, um, well, we want you to know uh, that your son has a failure to thrive. That was the official diagnosis. I'm like, well, where was that three months ago, six months ago, nine months ago? Because once they finally gave us the official diagnosis, a failure to thrive, everything kicked into gear. Now we get the test. Now we get the this and the that and endoscopies and all this stuff, figure out what's going on inside. And he has, like probably a lot of you have, just kind of have valve issues down there and flaps and this not closing and that. And, and so they figured all this out. They prescribed us some medicine that some of you also take, and they prescribe that medicine. And within about two days, our life completely changed. No more throwing up. And we were like, oh my goodness, we didn't realize how much that controlled our life. Our life revolved around that, his failure to thrive. Well, uh, and now... 20-something years later, it creates new challenges, as some of you guys know, and trying to figure out what, what do we do and this and that. So um, he, within a few days and then a few weeks, and now he's holding things down, and, and next thing you know, he's no longer failing to thrive, and he, he's fine today, and everything's, everything's good. But he had, in his life, a failure to thrive. And for many, perhaps most Christians... They're just surviving, like Cameron, just getting by. For most Christians, there is a failure to thrive in their life. There's a failure to thrive in their walk with Christ. 
Jesus told us that there is somebody who's doing everything he can to make sure you and I have a failure to thrive. Jesus said this in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, the thief, or we know that the thief is the enemy, the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We have an enemy who not only doesn't want you and I to thrive, he doesn't even want us to survive. This enemy literally wants to destroy you. The thief wants to steal your joy, to steal your morality, to steal your values, your reason for living. He wants to steal your identity in Christ. He wants to kill your dreams and your hopes and your future. He wants to destroy all of your relationships. If you're married with your spouse, if you have kids with your kids, with your friends, with your family, he wants to destroy companies. He wants to destroy churches. He's bent on destroying absolutely everything that God wants for your life. He wants you to fail to thrive. And he ultimately desires that all of us would join him in a place that we refer to as eternal death or eternal separation from God. That's been his plan. That's been his strategy since the very beginning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 says this, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Your enemy. Everybody say enemy. Your enemy, the devil. You see, the person sitting next to you, they aren't the enemy. The boss who's giving you a hard time at work, they aren't the enemy. The unruly customer isn't your enemy. The teacher, the coach, the church, the ex, they aren't the enemy. It's the devil. And he'll use your circumstances and your situations and people to try to wreak havoc on your life because he wants you to fail. He wants you to fail at life. He wants you to fail in your job, in your relationships. He wants you to fail in every aspect of your life. He wants to fail with your purpose in life. He wants you to fail to thrive. But there's another way. You and I can actually thrive. We can experience an incredible life. We can thrive in our relationships. We can thrive in our purpose. We can thrive in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our trials, in our circumstances. We can thrive over just surviving, and that's what this series is about. We can thrive over just surviving. So where do we start in that? Well, that's what we want to talk about today. You and I can thrive when we embrace joy and the adventure of following Jesus. You and I can thrive and not just survive when we embrace joy and the adventure that is following Jesus. Here's how Jesus said it. In John 10.10, 10, he said, The thief has come to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come, Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. One translation says, have it abundantly. Now, that Greek word for full or abundantly is the Greek word parisos. Fascinating, fascinating definition. It, when Jesus says, I have come that you may have life to the full, life abundantly, it literally means greater, exceeding, exceedingly. It means preeminence. I love this one. It means advantage. That's an interesting thought when you think about Jesus' words. It means overflowing, and it means having a surplus. One commentator explained this passage this way. He said, they, referring to people who follow Jesus and seek Jesus, they said, they shall not merely have life, simple, bare existence, but they shall have all those super added things which are needful to make their life eminently blessed and happy. Jesus wants you to thrive. He wants you to experience life to the fullest. He wants to give you an abundant life, not a failing life, not a floundering life, not simple, bare existence. He wants to make your life eminently blessed and happy. Now, this passage, talking of abundant life, it has two components to it. It has the eternal component, the eternity component, and that's part of what's going on here. The devil wants to destroy you here on earth, but he ultimately wants to destroy you in your sins and be eternally separated from God. And so Jesus says, I have come that you may have life. He's talking eternal life, that you can be forgiven of your sins. That's part of what Jesus is talking about. 
But this passage also refers to the quality of your life here on earth. That far too often, too many Christians have settled for less than what Jesus has offered us. We've misunderstood the uh, the, the Christian life, an experience with Jesus, and I see it all the time. I've been involved in people's life and ministry enough over the years, the last 30 years, and meeting with people, seeing people's life, counseling with people. I've seen enough to know that far too many Christians have settled, and they haven't experienced the abundant life in Jesus. And and I want to give you some of what that might look like for those who aren't experiencing abundant life in Jesus. It's not an all-inclusive list, but it's some of those things that I look, I see, I observe. And as you listen to this, You might find yourself saying, well, man, that one's me, or that's been my life. And if that's the case, you're just not experiencing the abundant life that Jesus has for you. So, for example, and again, I see it all the time. I mean, if you're you're married and your relationship with your spouse is awful, I just have news for you. You aren't experiencing the abundant life that Jesus came to give you. If you don't enjoy your work, guess what? You aren't experiencing life and purpose the way Jesus intended you to experience it. You're not experiencing abundant living in Jesus. If there's no purpose in your life, guess what? The devil's killed and stealed and stolen and destroyed your vision of abundant living in Jesus. If you're a divisive person or a contentious person or a, a jealous person, if you find that you're, you're angry and you constantly succumb to temptation, if, if you find you're, that you gossip and you won't forgive people, you're not experiencing the abundant life the way Jesus came to give it to you. If you find that you love material possessions and you want more than anything to be comfortable and warm and happy, even though you're up to debt in your eyeballs, You're not experiencing the abundant life Jesus has for you. If you lie to others or or maybe you dread being with others, if you find yourself saying, man, the reality is I just know I'm a hypocrite. If you're full of religious zeal and you're a pharisaical protector of doctrinal purity but with no love in your heart, if you're numb to the alarming human suffering statistics, if you truly don't care about your neighbor and their eternal status, if you're tired or bored or lost or lack purpose and direction and clarity, if you listen to any of that and you think, yeah, well, some of that's me or that one's me or those are me, listen, you've settled. You've settled for less than what Jesus has can't come to give you. You've been missing out on life to the fullest, real and better life, better than you can ever imagine, as some translations say of this passage in John 10.10. You are missing out on abundant life that Jesus has for you. Jesus invites you to a better way, to a better life. He invites you to embrace the adventure of following him. Because you recognize and realize, man, that's the only way when I embrace the adventure of following Jesus, that's the only way I'm going to experience the abundant life Jesus came to give me. Man, why wouldn't you want the exceeding, abundant, and glorious, and victorious life in Jesus? Why wouldn't you want that? Because that's what our Savior offers us. Now, there are some weights and anchors that hold us back from experiencing life to the fullest in our lives. It, it holds us back from, ex, it, but from what Jesus has for us, and you see that oftentimes in our reactions to our circumstances and to the pain in our life and to the trials in our life. Our typical responses to the difficulties and challenges that come our way, they often tear us up and tear us down and tear us apart, and they wreck us. And Jesus says, I offer a better way. I offer a better way when you embrace the adventure of following me and you dive deep into a relationship with me. That will end up affecting the way you see the world. It'll affect the way you see what happens in your life. Of course, of course, you and I are going to experience the highs and lows of life, right? But when you go after Jesus, 
when you stay connected to the vine, to use some Jesus language when he gave us that image of stay connected to the vine, when you put Jesus front and center in your life, when you put his mission and his purpose front and center in your life, it doesn't matter what the world throws at you. It just doesn't. In fact, Paul said it this way. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he said, be joyful always. Say the word always. always. Be joyful what? Always. always. He said, Paul said in Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord when? Always. always. And then Paul says, I just want to make sure you caught it, so I'm going to say it again. He says, rejoice. How could he say that? How could Paul say to rejoice in the Lord always, to be joyful always? It's because he knew. He knew from firsthand experience the contrast between uh, experiencing abundant life in Jesus and what it was like to pursue life outside of Jesus. He was one in whom the devil was doing a great job of robbing him and destroying him and killing him. He was religious. He was as religious as anybody. But the devil was wrecking him. But some of you know the story. When Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, and when he went all in with Jesus, when he embraced the great adventure of following Jesus, his life was radically changed, radically transformed. Sure, life stunk for Paul circumstantially. He went through what you and I can only imagine going through. His life circumstantially stunk on multiple occasions, as it does for us. But Paul knew in Christ alone, in Christ, bless you, in Christ alone, there is abundant living. In Christ alone, there is abundant life, exceedingly greater life than the world offers. And as Paul tried to pursue life to the fullest that only Jesus can provide, You know what happened to all his pain? It was put in the proper place. Didn't go away. But it was put in the proper place. He had a new perspective. And he embraced joy. And he embraced joy in every season in his life. And I'll just say this. One of the primary evidences or one of the primary fruit of a Jesus follower experiencing the abundant life, it's having the joy of the Lord in your life. If you want to know, hey man, am I experiencing abundant life? Do you have the joy of the Lord in your life? Nothing else even comes close. Because Jesus says, I'm going to give you something, and it's, it's an abundant life. It's an overflowing life, and that includes the joy of the Lord. In John chapter 15, it's an incredible passage, and Jesus is talking to his disciples and talking about him being the vine and stay connected to him. And he says, when you do that, and verse 10, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. And then Jesus says this. He says, I have told you these things. Everything I just talked about, remaining in me and staying connected and obeying my commandments. He says, I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Jesus says, I've given it to you. I've given you the recipe. I've shown it, you what it looks like. And if you live in that way, you, Jesus says, you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Somebody say overflow. overflow. Man, overflow. Your joy is going to overflow in your life. You remain in Jesus, which is to say you stay connected to him. You stay close to him. You have a relationship with him. Jesus says you will be filled with his joy. And it's an overflowing joy. It's an abundance of joy in your life. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. He said, even though you don't see him now, you believe, or some translations say you trust in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. You see, regardless of what you're going through, you can embrace the joy of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 says, in all our affliction... I am overflowing with joy. One translation says, my joy knows no bounds. Second Corinthians chapter 8, they are being tested by many troubles, and they are poor. Maybe you can relate to that. You have troubles, and you're poor, but they're filled with an abundant joy, which is overflowed with rich generosity. 
And then a passage you might be familiar with. Maybe you've memorized it in James chapter 1, verse 2, where James says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of various kinds. Do you want to thrive? Do you want to thrive? And not, amen. And not just, amen. And not just survive. Man, then embrace joy. Embrace the joy of the Lord because the abundant life, life to the fullest in Jesus, is a joy-filled life. And I gotta tell you, I've known many people over the years, and as I look out across the room, and, and it's some of you, where you thrive in the midst of your adversity. And I see in you, and you have that inexpressible joy. It's like you can't even describe it. And it comes out in ways you don't even know. And when you are full of the joy of the Lord, even in the midst of the trials, the circumstances, the pain, and the difficulty, I want to tell you that oftentimes is one of your greatest witnesses as a Jesus follower. What do I mean by that? Well, people are always curious how in the world you can have a steadfast, resolute determination and a quiet strength, even in the midst of your pain and suffering. People are curious about that. And they're like, how are you so calm? Or how are you so full of joy? They'll say it in different ways. And for those who understand this, who are experiencing the joy of the Lord and abundant life in Christ, they just say, man, my hope and my faith and my trust, it's in Jesus. It's not in the doctors, it's not in the medication, it's not in the schooling, it's not in the money, it's not in any of those things. It's in Jesus. And man, he just fills me with his peace and his joy and his contentment. And when people respond that way uh, and say that, somebody looks at them and says, man, I want that in my life. How do I get that? Ding, 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 ding. Now's your opportunity to share your testimony and to share Jesus with them. The joy of the Lord is one of your greatest test, uh, witnesses to your testimony. So I ask you, do you have the joy of the Lord? In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Somebody shout strength. strength. It's your strength. What about you? Because if I'm just being real, the reality is far too many Christians are just too uptight. They just are. Man, they're wound too tight. And they don't experience the joy of the Lord. They don't experience life to the fullest in Jesus. And they're crushed by their circumstances. And they spend more time making issues out of non-issues. And they turn something minor into something major. They major in the minors. And they get sidetracked. And they get off mission. In fact, Jesus made it clear while the devil oftentimes has victory in our lives and causes us to miss out on the full and abundant life in Jesus. And this is Jesus speaking to the church in Ephesus, and he says to them in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, but I have this complaint against you. I want you to imagine Jesus knocking on your door. You open the door, and you say, oh, man, it's Jesus. Hey, Jesus, what's up? And he says, hey, hello, I just want to tell you I got this complaint against you. Like sometimes that doesn't factor into our image of Jesus, does it? But Jesus said, I have this complaint against you. And you think, okay, Jesus doesn't seem to have a complaint against us about many things, so what, what is it? He says, you don't love me or each other as you did at first. A translation that maybe you've heard before if you've read this verse before, a translation that maybe you're familiar with is, you have left your first love. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me. Jesus says, man, you left. You lost your first love. You don't love me like you did when you first experienced my grace and my love and my forgiveness. You remember that? When you were all in and you talked about me and you praised God and you were in the word and you were soaking me up and you were so grateful that you would receive life and salvation and you're not there anymore. And you haven't been connected to me and you aren't embracing joy and the adventure of following me like you did at first. And so consequently, you are missing out on the abundant life in Jesus. The life, Jesus says, that I have for you. How does that happen? 
How did they get there? How do we get there? How do we abandon our first love in Jesus? Well, I can tell you it's a drift. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a drift. As we take tiny step by tiny step away from Jesus and into religion. Now, uh, I just we can use religion in all sorts of ways. Right now, I'm just using it more in a negative sense. It can be used in a positive sense. But when I use it in this sense, I'm saying we drift away to, from Jesus and we drift towards a religious life. And a religious life, what is that? That's for oftentimes, it's people who learn how to do church. It's people who learn how to do Christianity. And so they look the right way. They speak the right way. They, they outwardly, they, even, they love Jesus. So they have the appearance of somebody who, oh man, they must be the strong Christian, but their hearts are far from God. They've drifted from God. And so Jesus says to them, he says to us, turn back to him. Embrace the adventure of following Jesus. And in fact, Jesus reminded us, what did he say? He said, what's most important? What's the greatest priority in your life? Mark chapter 12, Jesus said, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's what it, it's where it starts. It's where it ends. That's where everything is. That's where our relationship is all about. Because Jesus says, it's all about your heart. Don't get sidetracked into a, quote, religious life. Getting wrapped up with everything around Jesus, but drifting away from Jesus, your first love. I think there's three simple ways that it's described, or three simple words that describe it best in the Bible. Mark chapter 3, verse 14, it says this. And this is something I've read many times, and I just drift through it. I don't even think about it, but it grabbed me. And it says this. Jesus appointed 12 that they might be with him. Jesus came to be with us, to be with him. He didn't call us to a host of rules and commandments and regulations to follow. That's an outflow of loving Jesus. First and foremost, Jesus called you to be with him. That's where it all starts. Everything else in our life flows out of being with him. Do you take that time each and every day to be with him, to be in the word of God, to, to talk to God, to seek his will and to seek his way? Jesus is the only one who can give you abundant life, life to the fullest. He's the only one. And it's a better life than you've ever dreamed of. And while it's available to every single person on planet Earth, it's only experienced by those who choose to be with him. Jesus wants nothing more but to have a special, close, connected, intimate relationship with you. And he knows that, that you have that and you will experience abundant life. You have that opportunity right now today not just to survive and barely get by and fail to thrive like my son did for the first year of his life, but you have an opportunity to thrive. Why wouldn't you take it? So let's embrace joy and the adventure of following Jesus. Your life, I can tell you this, it won't be boring. I can tell you this, you won't end up being overcome by the devil and you will be filled with passion and purpose. So are you ready? Are you ready to say, Jesus, I'm coming to you and I want to live and experience life to the fullest in you. If you're ready, we're going to pray about that now. Let's pray. Jesus, we come before you right now, God, recognizing that far too often we've settled and we have had a failure to thrive and we haven't been victorious in our life and we haven't experienced abundant life. Jesus, I recognize that in myself at times. And God, for some of us, the joy of the Lord isn't present. And so if you're here this morning, you're saying, man, I want the life that Jesus came to give me. I, don't, I want to thrive. I don't want to just survive. I want to thrive. If that's you, I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now. Say something like this. Just say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I've drifted, but that you came to be with me. So Jesus, right now, I return to you, my first love. And I choose to embrace joy in the adventure of following you. Jesus, I want to thrive. 
And so I step into my relationship with you. I will pursue you. In Jesus' name I pray. God, I also pray for those who are here who don't know you as Lord and Savior. And if that's you and you've never received Jesus into your life, man, he wants to give you an incredible life, eternal life, and a thriving life here on this planet. And if that's you and you say, I want to join the family of God, and I want to be forgiven of my sins, and I want to know eternity, and I want to know Jesus, if that's you, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. It's not really the exact words. It's more that you'd mean it in your heart. Say something like this. Say, Jesus, thank you that you would love me so much that you would die on a cross for my sins. So as best as I understand, in faith, I give my life to you. I surrender to you. Come into my life and be my Lord and be my Savior. I choose to no longer live for myself, but to live for you. Thank you, Jesus, for inviting me into your family. I love you. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Church, we're meant to thrive. Amen. Ushers, could you please come forward to hand out the elements? We exist, the church exists to honor and glorify Almighty God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We recognize as we continue to worship the Lord, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're remembering the immeasurable love of God that was demonstrated towards us. It is this single event in all of history that truly the church has been founded and established upon. In fact, what Jesus accomplished for us at the cross on our behalf and our right response to that is so critical that it can be readily seen in the testament of John the Baptist in John 3, 36. It reads, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Because of the fall of mankind in the garden, When Adam and Eve chose to disobey God by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, sin entered creation, severing mankind's relationship with them. And so now the result is that all of creation, mankind, is fallen and broken, sinful, and stands under the judgment of God, which is death. But God, in Christ, reconciled us back to himself through his sacrifice at the cross. You see, the penalty that we deserve Christ took upon himself, satisfying that righteous requirement demanded by a holy God. So it is through his resurrection that we have been justified, as well as confirmed everything Jesus said about himself. So it is by faith alone in Christ alone, and what he accomplished for us at the cross that gives us eternal life. So church, as we consume the elements today, we take that wafer of bread, which represents the body of Christ broken on our behalf, and the cup of juice represents his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And we, we do this, we remember the greatness of God's love given us through Christ. And we can happily proclaim just what the psalmist says in Psalm 32, 1. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. But unfortunately, this is not the case for the unbeliever because they still stand condemned under the judgment of God. But this is why those of us, we who have experienced the grace and peace of God, need to go to those who have not yet trusted in Christ, to the one who could truly save their souls from destruction. And then, then, and then, and only then, will they be able to see how great our God truly is. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, again, thank you for saving us from our sins through the one and only risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us new life through your sacrifice and resurrection. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fill us anew and allow us to always magnify and glorify God the Father in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. got nothing new How could I express all my gratitude How could sing these songs as I often do But every song will stay
we love you we thank you so much for this day for this time where we get to praise you and let us not only praise you and throw up our hands today but let's praise you every day God because you are worthy we lift your name up and we give you all the glory it's in your name we pray amen and we have the prayer team on both sides of the stage if you're in need of prayer or have something to pray about or, or give praise to our God and King we'd love to pray with you go and have a great rest of your Sunday and we'll see you next time